We're going to take a look at more recent changes, uh, recent meaning over the past decades and, and see what has changed in France. Uh, we're going to focus on human beings. Human beings are social beings and uh, are therefore highly influenced in terms of consumption by ideas, societal ideas at a given point of time. So we've talked a lot about food habits uh, and I'm going to demonstrate that food habits are not that resilient and are not that permanent as one might think. We're going to see that since the 60s, things uh, we have changed about seven times in, in a fairly fundamental way in the type of food uh, we like to eat and also in our representation of food. This is um, research done by sociologists and uh, as you can see, our food habits have changed and we very much identify with imagery, with the images uh, vehiculated in our society. For example, in the 60s, <clears throat> what counted was quantity, was the amount of food. And it was then recommended that one should eat more starch, more bread, uh, for example, food that stuffs the stomach. And uh, <clears throat> it was important back then to eat more. I'm not going to detail uh, this slide, which I will, I can provide to you, but this is very interesting because it shows that we went from eating more to eating less. Then we went to eating fast. This is in the early 80s uh, with a very minimal relationship with food. And we're also seeing the appearance of new products with a lot of services attached to them to eat fast, fast food. Then um, food free, uh, f food without um, fat, uh, fat free, salt free, and so on. Um, then we had to eat right, then we had to eat with, and today we are more into sustainable food. <clears throat> so all these um, evolutions show that we are very much influenced by the society we live in. Now. Are we really, right as, as I'm speaking, going through a new period of change? Well, clearly safety is one of the key expectations of consumers today. The slightest health issue is extremely disruptive and has an impact on consumption. What people also want is natural products, fun, pleasure, practical and convenient products. And then there are more recent expectations, societal, citizen expectations, who are little by little <clears throat> growing and developing and which do have an important impact on our choices when it comes to food. They are more, I would say, environmental, with a focus on ethics, so socially ethical products. Increasingly, people are looking at traceability and origin and people are increasingly interested in animal welfare. Again, ethics and environment. This slide shows what people consider to be quality. As you can see, taste comes first, along with price. And then, the environment, respecting the environment and animal welfare. It is right there. Those come um, right after economics. So new attributes are emerging and are gaining weight. So how does that translate uh, in our society? Well, what we are seeing is uh, a reduction of hyper-consumption. Hyperconsumption is unlimited spending in hypermarkets. What we are seeing, however, is an increase of hard discounters. They have doubled their market share between 2001 and 2006. And don't think that um, only the poor people shop in discounters. This is absolutely not true. <clears throat> Thank you.
What we are also seeing, and the media testify to this, we are, people, the French are increasingly cooking again. Simply looking at what is available on TV today testifies to this. Uh, increasingly we're seeing um, TV shows around food. We're also seeing, to a certain extent, medicalization of food with what we call in French the alicament, which we could translate as functional food. Um, uh, 32 euros per citizen in France versus 167 euros in Japan. So the French are still attached, I would say, to tradition, even if I don't like uh, that word, but maybe to, to their old ways of consuming. What we are seeing as well is a very clear emergence of organic produce. It uh, represents only 2% of the overall food market in France, but what we also see is that 50% of the French eat organic food at least once a month, and that is quite significant. People feel that they eat organic food to be militants, to, uh, to be activists, to make a point, and also for health reasons. What people want is proximity. We live in a globalized world, and increasingly people want to buy locally. And it is a very deliberate choice to buy in local stores versus hypermarkets, who are generally outside of our cities. And as a matter of fact, some of uh, the retailers have adapted to this by opening smaller uh, format stores in city centers. People want to eat more responsibly, again, by eating more local food. And people want to products that are readily available. What we are seeing um, are organizations like AMAPS, who are um, produce growers who organize themselves uh, <coughs> to provide their produce to local populations. These are growing. We're also seeing uh, food chains that are selling products uh, that come from within a 200 kilometer radius of where they are located. We're also seeing increasingly more fair trade, fair trade food, even though there are some hurdles. Price, fair trade products are considered as expensive and consumers oftentimes consider that there are not enough benefits attached to fair trade products. And those benefits are still lacking. As I said, animal welfare. Animal welfare I have positioned uh, right here. Uh, animal welfare is, uh, does not play uh, a major role uh, in France at this point compared to other countries, but this may change. Uh, there are some studies that have looked at uh, developing a European label uh, on, uh, about animal welfare. For example, in France, 70% of eggs are coming from hatcheries, um, uh, when in other countries like uh, Belgium, Austria, Germany, those have been completely abandoned. So we still have a long way to go to improve animal welfare. However, we are increasingly um, concerned about the environmental impact of our food. We are looking at developing um, uh, labeling about the carbon footprint of food, uh, which should be effective in 2012. So those modern trends, are they a reality in France? Well, we talk about them a lot. But I think that the French are still very much attached to family production. Um, for example, most of the food um, is prepared at home and consumed at home. I think I can skip
those charts, I think I have more interesting data for you in the next slides. What is interesting is to look at uh, how many people eat out. As you can see, uh, there are ups and downs, but uh, overall, people tend to eat out more, and it represents eating out represents about 5% of their uh, budget. As you can also see, uh, eating in is uh, about 14%. It, counts, it represents about 14% of the budget. So eating out is increasing, but it's still very modest compared to other countries like the US, for example. So how informed are we really? Are consumers really in France? Then <clears throat> Consumers are individualists. They're, uh, they have little education to make truly informed decisions. What we can say is that consumers uh, have a lot of uncertainty because of too much information. Uh, and too much information kills information. Too many labels to inform people. In Europe, we have roughly 100 different labels. How could you possibly uh, remember what they all stand for and what they represent? And then the environmental message, uh, which is clearly influencing uh, the French. Well, again, there are two big trends that are very opposed. There's the environment on one side and nutrition on the other side. Where do you really go? Is it easy? Well, it, it is not that easy. As a matter of fact, it is a very difficult call. People are uh, increasingly educated uh, about nutrition and what the, with this kind of information, this is, an, this is the, the double nutritional pyramid with the food you should eat um, uh, at, 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 at the bottom, the food you should, eat, should you should eat frequently, and at the top, the food you should not eat too frequently. Well. Based on the current available knowledge, if you take the environmental pyramid, it's the exact opposite. It shows that the products you should not eat too frequently are the most interesting from an environmental standpoint. So there's a clear opposition. It's almost systematic. Uh, it's a systematic opposition between the food pyramid on the left side and the environmental pyramid on the right side. So the bottom line is it, it is a very complex uh, issue. So we have questions for which the answers to which the answers seem to be counterintuitive. For example, should consumers limit their meat intake and eat more vegetables? Should consumers buy organic food or conventional food? Should they buy local or imported? Season products? or products around the year. How about the packaging? A lot of questions, a lot of question marks. Um, Husband represents 18% of the greenhouse uh, emissions uh, worldwide. 8% of uh, the world consu water consumption, 70% of deforestation and the Amazon. So clearly, uh, meat is an issue. However, there are other studies that show that uh, fruits and vegetables that are produced in greenhouses, for example, if they travel as much as 600 kilometers, well, their environmental impact is extremely significant, more so than milk, for example, when the milk is produced and consumed locally. So, once again, the answers may seem obvious, but they're not. Next question is organic versus conventional food. Here are several studies. This is a recent one in Austria that shows that uh, clearly greenhouse uh, emissions are more significant for uh, meat, uh, once again, and if you compare organic uh, farming versus uh, conventional farming, well, the impact is significantly lower when you are, uh, when you're dealing with organic um, farming versus conventional. Local versus global. Everybody says you have to eat local, true, but local doesn't necessarily mean the best. And again, we have some interesting scientific studies that show that uh, the massification of shipping does have benefits. For example, large containers that are shipped overseas 
uh, are quite interesting from a cost standpoint and, and much better versus uh, in terms of greenhouse emissions versus trucks. So again, the answer may seem obvious, but it is not. Some local systems are extremely complex, require a lot of natural resources, for example, um, greenhouses that are used in the production of fruits and vegetables, or uh, freezers or ventilated rooms that are used to um, store fruits and vegetables for long periods of time. For, for example, apples. Apples can be kept for several months in um, big freezers, and the environmental impact is much more significant than products that are imported and produced in a different way. There is a Scottish uh, study that shows that uh, local products or even alternative products are very sustainable because they still fall into the industrial supply chains. Our fresh products are stored, shipped, sometimes processed, washed, <clears throat> and so on, before they make it to the final consumer, and they therefore have a significant impact on the environment and consume a lot of energy. So let's not be mistaken when it comes to local production. Is local sustainable? The answer is not always. A comparative there, have, there have been comparative studies on apples and, for example, the storage of apples in uh, freezers have, has a significant impact which could offset the distance. So sometimes it makes more sense to import apples from Chile rather than consuming locally grown apples that have been stored in a freezer for months. Seasonal products or year-round products? Well, what products increasingly want is to have the same products around the year. We've lost the seasonality. So what do you do? Well, you either import or you produce locally in greenhouses, especially for uh, fruits and vegetables. So, oftentimes a lot of products are um, shipped by plane, which makes the product a lot, a lot more expensive and the impact on um, the footprint, the common footprint, is much more significant. Here's an example of uh, green beans coming from Kenya. And again, when fruits and vegetables are grown in greenhouses, well, the CO2 emissions are four times superior. A recent study in Germany has shown that uh, in wintertime it makes more sense to import salad from Spain rather than producing it uh, locally uh, in a greenhouse simply because the impact, uh, the, the carbon footprint is uh, twice as high. So when we're talking about season products, what seasonality are we really talking about? Are we talking about the season at a given point in time? <coughs> Doesn't it make more sense to eat uh, tomatoes uh, grown in Morocco during the tomato season uh, rather than eating French tomatoes grown in a greenhouse in France in wintertime? So the question of season needs to be specific to a region or a country. Then there is the selection, the, the question of selecting products. The concentration of nutrients seems to be seems to have dropped significantly since the 50s. And this is coming from a Canadian and that later an American study. Since the 50s, uh, uh, Canadians and Americans have analyzed the nutrients in fruits and vegetables. And the study shows that in the 50s, eating a banana, an orange or a peach, was almost enough to get enough vitamin A, or pro-vitamin A, sorry. Today you would need five bananas. 10 oranges and 26 peaches to get the same amount of pro-vitamin A. So there is a, a very significant decrease in the concentration of nutrients. This is, uh, can be explained by our farming methods and also because of different uh, varieties that are grown today. My last point will be on packaging. And this is an interesting study on carrots. What we have is the, the environmental cost. You have different types of products, fresh, 
frozen, canned, different types of packaging. So if you are looking for an ecologically cheap or uh, low impact product, well, you can go for the plastic bag or the can. If you want a combination of the most interesting product from a nutritional standpoint and low environmental impact, well, the choice varies. You can uh, choose the fresh carrots and you can uh, choose the, the canned food. If um, you're looking for price, uh, for example, uh, then you would go for the canned food. So depending on the criteria, your choice will go for one product rather than another. But again, you, do, as a consumer, do not have the information to make a well-informed decision. So back to the nutritional recommendations. Um, I'm not going to list them and read them, but clearly, we need more. We need to eat more fruit and vegetable. The question is again: Should they should they be processed? Should they be fresh? What about fruits and vegetables grown in greenhouses? Clearly, if you are environmentalist, well, the question is not that simple. And again, information needs to be available. We need. We know we need more calcium, therefore dairy products. But we know the impact on the environment is significant. How about mineral water? Is it truly necessary to eat mineral water uh, when the water? we drink uh, in the coming from the faucet is uh, very good. Again, we know that there, there is a significant impact coming from mineral water on the environment. How about fish? Do we really need to eat, to eat more fish? We know that the, the, the fish stocks are decreasing. And fish farms have a significant impact, once again, on the environment. Uh, oftentimes, we need to fish, catch a lot of small fish to feed the bigger fish. Are as meat. Once again, if we preserve, if we if we keep using extensive uh, farming, well, we know that the, the, the prairies can uh, sequester a lot of carbon, which can be good to a certain extent. My very final question: in this context, in this landscape. Uh, how much room is left for modern food? Well, we have five scenarios that have been identified by Pierre Feuillet that are listed here. And this would be in a perfect world where science builds the best world based on biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, genetically modified organisms, aromas, and so on. The second scenario is where the public authorities are very directive and prescribe uh, or, or decide on specific policies, um, food policies, according to uh, nutrigenomics, uh, peptides, um, appetite suppressors, and so on. Third scenario is uh, a scenario in which the uh, agri-food industry imposes its, uh, its products. The fourth and the fifth uh, are closer to what we are seeing today, and this seems to be a more recent trend, protecting our um, environment with a very strong uh, rejection of junk food, fast food. Uh, rejection as well of consumerism, and on the contrary, a society where people seem to favor products coming from from the land. So it is really in, 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 in scenario, scenarios four and five we're in. And again, there is room for progress. And, and we do need progress to uh, develop new technologies to protect nutrients and lower the impact on the environment. So could this be the solution? A little bit like in Vancouver, this is the 100 Mile Diet Association in Vancouver. Better tasting, better for the environment, better for local economies, and better for your health. Eat within 100, uh, 100 mile radius. This is uh, very close to what I said earlier. 
uh, some organizations are doing the same thing in France. So might this be the future to develop regional autonomy? We don't know. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martin Padilla, for this presentation. A lot of this is quite surprising and unexpected, uh, especially when it comes to eating local um, or growing local. It obviously still raises many questions. At one point, uh, you said that there is a, there was a, there is a multiplication of labels, uh, so much information being available, and we went from informed consumers to confused consumers. <clears throat> so again, one might want to educate people more to, for them to understand that local doesn't necessarily mean better. So, where is the solution? What do you think could be done to better inform consumers? <clears throat> Well, as I said, there is a proliferation of labels, a proliferation of information, which has led to confusion. Some recent studies, the, the uh, Nutri-Santé Barometer in France has shown that there is a regression of, uh, that people seem to be less interested by labels. Are you saying that people don't believe in it anymore? Well, people, right, people don't believe in labels anymore. They still see labels as a sign of quality, but there is so much information. Uh, and, and the information that is available is so misleading uh, that, um, that people don't really believe in it anymore. And instead, people prefer proximity products, natural products, that they believe are more trustworthy, rather than having labeled products. Okay. And then it was interesting to see the five scenarios, the, the number four and five is like closer to today's world. It seems that indeed we are following scenario four and five. You are right, indeed. And personally, I think that we can expect more change, uh, more societal changes. Uh, and when I say change, I, I mean major changes uh, compared to what we have seen so far. Again, well-being, ethics, sustainable, um, all, these, all these considerations will require uh, immediate and substantial changes in the way we organize our, ourselves and the way, in the way we produce. So I think we can expect major changes in the near future. And the way, and also the price, the way we calculate the price of food, we can expect to see change. And the price of food, when you break down the value of a product, of a food product, it, 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 very, it, it can vary greatly depending on the different stakeholders, the different players along the value chain. And I think that the environmental impact increasingly needs to be taken into account, it needs to be calculated and factored into the final uh, retail price. So are you saying that we're coming to the end of an era of mass consumption? Yes, absolutely. And I think that we are at the very beginning of a revolution. You mentioned the AMAPs, uh, producer organizations to that, that, that cater to their local communities. Uh, and it seems that in France, increasingly people are attracted by those. Yes, yes. And again, I think that that is because of too much globalization. Um, people have, I wouldn't say have lost part of their identity. Uh, well, maybe, maybe I should say a loss of their identity. Maybe that we have less regional identities today. That The fact that they can buy local, uh, in a sense, is a way to reconstruct. People need to be reassured, and globalization is not reassuring and, and has, has raised a lot of, has, has caused a lot of uncertainty. So what people need today is, 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 is more proximity needs to be closer to themselves and closer to their local productions.